Well, it is great to be here with you guys. Uh, I've met a few people already who are like, man, do I know you? You look familiar. What's going on? And my family has a picture probably about there in this hallway of, of churches that you guys have supported. And the reason no one's really put it together, because in that picture, I don't have a beard. Um, and now I do, so it gets confusing. But uh, Grace has really been uh, just a blessing to us personally, as well as to our church. Uh, you've supported us for the last few years. And uh, I tell you what, you have a pretty wonderful pastor in Pastor Phil. Uh, he's the kind of guy that where my wife and I have come to different retreats and different Acts 29 events around. He's just he was nice to me, and I didn't know why. I mean, I always think everything's a trap. And I'm like, why is this guy being so nice to me? What does he want from me? What's going on here? But he has just been nothing but generous and supportive of me personally and me and my wife as well as our church. And so uh, it was fun when he reached out and said, hey, the, they're giving me a sabbatical. I'd love for you to come preach. I said, yes, because I wanted to be able to stand up here in front of you as a church and just say thank you. Thank you for the support and the generosity towards a gospel work in a place that maybe some of you have never even been to. And I think it's so great that there's a culture here with you as a people wanting to support kingdom work going out, even though you're not like directly on the ground doing it. So thank you so much for what you've done for our church. Uh, it's been a benefit to us getting going. Um, well, I, a little bit about me before we jump into this. Uh, I am married to my wife, Cherish. She was able to come with me. Uh, we've been married for a little over 20 years. We have four kids. Uh, a 19-year-old daughter, 17-year-old son, a 14-year-old daughter, and a 10-year-old daughter. We did not bring them. Uh, and so we were able to come, and I was, I was, we were talking on the way over here, and I, I don't know if I've been to Bend before. Both my wife and I grew up in Albany on the other side, uh, and I, I, I was trying to, I don't know if I did. But we've had a great time so far. We were able to uh, stay with Jim and Jerry, yeah, in their place, which was just great. A super fun time. We were able to go uh, to Prineville to visit some friends, and I just... I sat in Les Schwab and I just, I just breathed it in. It smelled like breaks and freedom. It was a really great experience for me. Um, as I mentioned, we planted Sufficient Grace December of 2020. I, I referenced I'm bivocational. Uh, the other job that I have is I'm actually a police officer with the Seattle Police Department. And when I said that, two things popped into your mind. And I just want to address it. Number one, I can't do anything about your, your speeding ticket. Um, we're in Oregon. I have no jurisdiction here. I can't do anything. The other thing that popped into your head is whatever stories you've heard about Seattle and how crazy it is, they're probably absolutely true. Like it's... It's probably true. Uh, and so that's something I've done for uh, over a decade now as a police officer and then really feeling called to plant and really feeling called to do both those things at the same time. And so I get asked constantly, well, when, when are you going to quit being a cop and be a full-time pastor? What does that look like? And I don't know. Uh, both my wife and I have felt really convicted that God has wanted us to do both things. With that, as we prepare to jump in, uh, on the way over, my wife kind of ran me through uh, what, how to present myself here. She, she explained to me that I'm what's known as an acquired taste, that sometimes that first, <laughs> first meeting, it's a little hard. And you guys don't know me the way my people do. And while Paul talked about there's two natures of the spirit and the flesh, I have two natures of pastoral and cop. And, and so those sometimes war against each other. And I'm gonna do my best to keep things in pocket uh, as we go. Um, I, I will ask, sorry, is there a way to get a confidence timer up there? Because if there's not, I won't stop. It's not a gift for me, it's a gift for you guys. <laughs> well, what we're gonna be, we're gonna be in Psalm 34. So if you have your Bibles, your devices, or whatever you have, if you open up to Psalm 34, as Pastor Phil sent out to, to me and some other people that are coming to visit you guys, uh, he said, hey, I just, it's a summer of wisdom. Anything in the wisdom literature uh, that you feel God laying on your heart. And Psalm 34, I've always loved. Uh, it's got that, just that great line that's kind of the, the, hint, the hinge of the psalm, right? Taste and see the Lord is good. I said, man, I love this psalm. I want to unpack it for us. So we're going to be going through Psalm 34. It is one of what's called the alphabetical psalm. So Psalm 9, 10, 25, 34, 37, 111, 112, 119, and 145 have some sort of pattern of the Hebrew alphabet. Psalm 34 is one. There are 22 verses in this psalm. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and each line starts with the next letter. We obviously missed that in our translation because it's from the Hebrew alphabet. But it is uh, more poetic and more musical than I think what we read out of this. Uh, and so each verse begins with that. And today, really what we're going to focus on is the idea of faith and fear. 
We want to unpack this concept of living out of fear and the concept of living out of faith and what that means for us. The Bible defines faith in Hebrews 11 verse 1, and it says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So what that means is people of faith are assured and convicted of many different things. We're assured and convicted of something that happened in the past. Jesus' death on the cross, and the, kind of the theological term for that is justification. That when Jesus died on the cross and he paid a debt that we owed, we are justified before God because of the debt that we owed. We're also, people of faith are assured and convicted uh, of the present that God is continually working on us. The term for that is sanctification. Like it's an ongoing becoming more and more like Jesus as we walk with him. And that means people of faith are assured and convicted of the future, a term called glorification, that one day we will not even have the presence of sin around us as we walk with him. And I, I think typically as Christians, especially in America, we, we spend a lot of time talking about the past and the future right? Which, which is good. We talk about what it means, Jesus' death on the cross and what, what that implies for us. And we talk a lot about, right, heaven. We talk about what it means when no more tears, no more pain. But what, what, about, what about the now, right? What about that sanctification process? What about the here and the now? So if you become a Christian and, and you walk with Jesus for what, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years before dying, is our life just relegated to we know what happened a long time ago and we just have to white knuckle through life and know eventually it's going to get better? Well, John 10.10, 10, Jesus makes this proclamation that I came that you might have life and life abundantly. Well, that doesn't sound like abundant life to me. Just struggling and hanging on and waiting for heaven. I think there's something for us now. Second Peter 1.3, Peter says this, his, meaning God, divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So what does that mean? We have all things that pertain not just to godliness, but to life, meaning your everyday life. You're getting up, going to work, raising kids, being married, uh, part of your HOA, being a good neighbor, just all things that pertain to life we've been granted resource for. But how often do we functionally forget that we've been granted all things that pertain to life? And then we gotta ask the question, well, what, what, what causes us to functionally forget some of those things? I would argue that what causes us to forget those things is fear. That fear is what causes us to functionally, and I keep saying functionally because if you were to sit and, and have a conversation, you would say, no, 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 listen, I can list for you the resources and this is what it means to walk with Jesus, but then you live out of this sense of not walking in that and not truly letting it settle on your heart. We're functionally forgetting those things. I think fear is a lack of belief in the truths of God. You see, I think faith and fear are two sides of the same coin, that the opposite of faith is not doubt. I think the opposite of faith is fear. And so we want to talk about that because you see, when we live out of fear, I think fear takes us to places we never thought we'd go. I think fear has us doing things we never thought we would do. And I think fear has us saying things we never thought we'd say. And I think Psalm 34 gives an explanation of that. So let's get into this. There's a preamble of the psalm that you see in your Bible, and this is what it says of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. I don't know the average age of this church, but if anyone got down on VH1 behind the music in the early 2000s, that's what this is. This is a VH1 behind the music scene. And maybe you're curious, like what inspires some of the great songs? What were artists thinking about? What was happening in their lives uh, when they wrote different songs? And what Psalm 34 does actually gives us a little insert like, well, this is what was happening with David. So I think for us to actually settle and understand what David is writing, what was happening in David's life that drove him to this? If you're new to Bible and to church, when I say David, this is the same David of David and Goliath. After he killed Goliath, all right, wonderful scene where Goliath was taunting the people of Israel. No, no soldier would step forward and fight him. And then David, who was just not even in the army, he came to give his brothers who were in the army some food. 
and he saw Goliath taunting Israel and the God of Israel and said, what is going on here? Why aren't you guys doing anything about it? And he said, I'll go fight him because I, I, I'm fighting for God. Goes, grabs his sling, right, swing, hits him, knocks him down, cuts his head off with his own sword. Well, after that, there's these group of women that made up this song. And Saul was the king of Israel at the time. He was the king that was sitting in one of the tents, listening to Goliath mock Israel and mock the God of Israel. And as the king, he was scared and wouldn't do anything. So these women came up with this song and it said, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands, which is a little excessive, a little hyperbolic. And what happened though was Saul heard this. He heard this song being sung and he became incredibly jealous. Couldn't believe that they were giving David all this credit and all this praise. And so he naturally tried to kill David. That's what you do when you feel jealousy, right? So he tried to kill David. David was afraid and he fled from Saul's court. He ended up fleeing to a place called Ramah and he was with Samuel the prophet, who's another famous person in this time. And we're in the book of 1 Samuel, like around 17, 18, chapter 19, 20, right in there. But then when he's sitting with Samuel, Saul heard where David was and he sent these like assassins to go get him. He said, hey, I want you to go get David, kill him, bring him back his body kind of thing. And it says, David was afraid and he fled from there. He ended up going to a place called Nob and he met with the priest there, Ahimelech. And the priest came out. He knew David. He said, David, what's going on? And David lied the first time to the priest. And he said, well, the king has sent me on a secret mission. It's a mission I can't even tell you about. And the priest said, okay, well, yeah, what do you need? The king sent you on a secret mission. What do you need? And he said, well, I need some food. And the priest said, well, I don't have any food. The only food I have is something called the show bread or the bread of the presence or the holy bread. And it was a special thing that was meant in the place of offerings. And it was a Levitical law that only the priests could eat that bread. David lied again to the priest. And he said, no, 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 I can eat that bread. And the priest said, okay, like I have no reason to question. I mean, you're David, like here, here's, here's the bread. He gave him the bread. Then David asked the priest, hey, I need a weapon. The secret mission was so serious. I left, I didn't even have my sword. Like, I need something. And the priest said, well, I, like, I'm a priest. I don't have any weapon. The only thing I have here is actually the sword of Goliath. And it's on display as like a memorial of what God did with you. And David said, well, I can take that sword. He wasn't supposed to take the sword. And the priest said, okay, here you go. And then David was afraid because he knew Saul found out where he was. And he fled to a place called Gath. And what's sad is later Saul finds out that the priest of Nob assisted David. And Saul, because he was crazy, killed the priest and his entire family. So David ran to Gath, which Gath is the home of Goliath. So if you're thinking, I became famous for killing this incredible warrior, you know where I should hide out? In his hometown where everybody knows who I am and everybody knows I'm the one that killed their most famous warrior. So it turns out he was recognized immediately because it's gotta be the worst place for him to hide out. And he gets brought in front of the king, Achish of Gath. Elimelech in our Psalm, that just means king. He gets recognized immediately, he gets brought in front of the king and he was so scared, he knew the king would kill him. So he said, well, here's what I'll do. And he literally acted crazy. He scribbled stuff on a wall. It said he let his spittle and drool go down into his beard. And he did everything he could to actually act mentally insane to where the king said, what? like, why'd you bring me this guy? He's a madman. And yet David, who he was known as the warrior for God who killed Goliath. And now what is he? He had a mental breakdown and he's just some crazy guy now. But it worked. The king didn't want to kill him and king let him go. But David was still afraid and he fled to a cave. And this is what it says. It says he's in this cave. It says everyone who is in distress, in doubt, and bitter in soul came to be with David. It said about 400 men. So David now, out of fear, has looked around and he has ended up in a cave surrounded by people that you would not allow babysit your kids. I'll tell you that right now. You wouldn't even sell them a car if you're a car salesman. If you're not, it'd be weird that you'd think about selling him a car. So here he is, he's in a cave. 
He's thinking back over this last period of time. And what did he do? He ran from his home. He went to towns he should have never gone to. He lied multiple times to a priest. And now he's looking around saying, I'm in a cave surrounded by effectively dirt bags. And it's that, that's the context that he then writes this psalm. That as he's sitting there reflecting on how living out of life of fear has had him doing things he never thought he'd do has him going places he never thought he'd go and has him saying stuff he never thought he would say. And in that reflection, he then writes this song. Let's get into it. In the first three verses, David unpacks for us three things he did that moved him from fear to faith. Verse one of 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. David says, I will commit to creating spaces in my life to regularly praise God. Because you know what? I don't think it comes supernaturally to us. So we have to ask the question as we look at this, well, how are we creating spaces in our lives that lead us into praising God? And I think it needs to be intentional. When you're in your car, are you listening to Praise music? Or are you listening to just political commentary? The latest podcast? Are you attending the gathering? I know you guys are. I, I can see you. But are you attending the gathering regularly that leads you into worship? We just had a wonderful time of musical worship. Are you a part of some kind of a, a small group or discipleship group? During the announcement time, we just listed out a bunch of stuff happening in the fall for you to get in places where you can be reminded to praise David says that it needs to be a part of your life, not haphazardly when you step into it or not. It needs to be a calendared event of creating spaces in your life. Verse two, as David continues, he says, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. David remembers what God has done and he boasts about it. We hear the word boasting or bragging, and it's super negative, right? Because typically when we're boasting or bragging, it's, it's how do I get attention on me? How, how do I say something to impress others? And I want people to think really well of me. <clears throat> Excuse me. What does it mean to boast in God? In the Old Testament, whenever something really significant uh, happens, something crazy, like uh, when they crossed the Jordan River, right? God stopped the river and he parted it. They went to the other side and he had them uh, pile up a bunch of rocks as a memorial, Right, the closest thing we have, I mean, we're in Bend. There's a lot of hikers. What are those things called? Like Karens? Karens? I don't know what they say. I'm not a hiker. And so people would set up these memorials. And the point of the memorial was when you're walking around and you're with your kid and your kid goes, hey, dad, what's that huge pile of rocks? And you go, oh, man, let me tell you a crazy story. I was there. The Jordan River opened up in front of us and we walked across. It was the idea of putting things in your way that when you bump into him, you go, oh, I remember what God did here. David is saying, I'm going to remember about the stuff God did and I'm not just going to remember, I'm going to brag about it. What are some things in your life? What have you done? Is it a prayer journal maybe? What is your pile of rocks that you can put around you in your home all over the place? I mean, seriously, it could be tattoos. It could be pictures. It could be things on your phone. It could be a prayer journal. It could be so many things where someone, the idea is someone asks, hey, what's going on here? You go, oh man, let me tell you this crazy story. Let me tell you about what God did in me. Let me tell you about how God changed my heart. Let me tell you about how I didn't think God was gonna provide and then God came through and was faithful to his promises. Let me tell you this story that's gonna blow your mind because I wanna brag about God. I don't wanna brag about me. I wanna brag about God though. David says, I'm gonna remember I'm going to remember him and I'm going to brag about him to everybody. And then in verse three, the third thing he gives us is he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. David invites others into praising God with him. We are not called to live this life alone, guys. We are not called to run off to a monastery and be isolated away from people. We are called to be in community with others. David is saying, I want people to praise God with me. Bring you in so I can worship together. What does this look like for you? How are you surrounding yourselves with community that's pointing towards worshiping God? 
through a small group, a disciple group, a Bible study, involving people in your lives to worship God with you. And so David moves in this first section, David moves from fear to faith. Remember, he's looking in this cave, he's looking around at these guys, probably thinking like, I don't super like any of you. Well, how am I here? I used to be in the king's court playing a harp. Girls were singing songs about me. It was dope. And now I'm in this cave. Why am I here? And he's seeing how he lived out of fear and where it brought him. He's saying, I gotta, I gotta change. I gotta change my head here. I need to remember to be praising God. I need to remember what he did and I need to brag about it. And I need others to come worship with me. So once he does that, after he builds a pattern of praise, he remembers what God has done. He invites others to him. He then kind of lists for us, I think, some of the outcomes of living from faith as opposed to fear. He gives us four things in the next few verses. He tells us that God answers, God removes shame, God saves, and God protects. Verse four, this is what it says. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from my fears. God answers. Do you ever feel like God doesn't answer prayers? Do you sometimes have a hard time relating to the great American theologian, Garth Brooks? I thank God for unanswered prayers. (laughs) Do you ever wonder like, where's God? I'm asking and I'm asking, I'm begging, I'm begging. And he's just not, he's just not showing up here. David tells us, no, no, guys, God, God answers. First John 5 says something similar. This is what John says. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. See, often I think when we're in tough spots, we ask God desperately, I mean earnestly, to change our circumstance. I think we rarely step into like, God, change me. God, there's this thing, this stress, this heat, this pain that I don't like. Can you please fix it? I would imagine that'd be, I'd be tempted if I were David, sitting in the cave, looking around at all the people that are with me. I'm saying, God, you got to get me out of this cave. You got to fix this. In times of fear, we want to change whatever it is that we're scared of. Money issues, what people think of you, control over my kids, my marriage, my job. I will tell you that God is far more concerned with changing you than he is with changing your circumstance. And I can guarantee you, and the Bible gives us promise after promise after promise, God answers you. And you say, well, I don't know. Because I've been praying for a new motorhome for like two years, and there is no motorhome in my driveway. God answered you, church. God said, what in the world are you praying about? But I tell you, you start praying for like, God, I want my heart to be more pointed towards you. God, I, I want to think of you more. I want to worship you more. God, I want you to make me more and more like Jesus. 100% guaranteed God answers that prayer every time. So David tells us, no, God answers. He goes on in verse five is where we are. Those who look look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. God removes shame. You see, church, fear brings on shame. Every time, fear brings shame. Shame comes from internalized guilt, social pressures, condemnation from others maybe. Shame leads us to depression, anxiety, isolation. It has us withdraw. It has us not press in at all. Shame is not from God. What does David say here? He says, looking towards God removes shame. And how can we know that? We can know it in one way because of Romans 8.1, where Paul says, there is therefore now No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That God removes shame. I think sometimes we have a hard time splitting the difference between shame and conviction. You see, church, shame puts you internally. It has that negative self-talk. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I can't make it. I I can't believe I did this. What do everyone think about me? I shouldn't go around anyone because I'm so embarrassed. Conviction is a gift, it's a gift from the Holy Spirit to remind us of our sin and yet always, always, always points us to the one who can actually deal with our sin. 
You see, conviction doesn't push us inward. It pushes us outwards towards God. That God actually removes shame. That God can take a murdering terrorist and use him to be one of the most influential characters in building his church in the first century. God can remove shame of someone who denies even knowing who he is to actually being the rock of the church in Jerusalem in the first century. And he can take the shame of whatever it is you've been through and he can still use you to reach nations. God removes that shame. And David is telling us, can you imagine the amount of shame David has? He he knew Saul. You don't think he probably knew what was going to happen to the priest of Nob? You don't think he probably had an idea? Well, Saul's pretty crazy, pretty quick to murder. He's going to find out that this guy helped me. And I lied to him multiple times. You don't think David had some shame in what he did? And yet he's being reminded, he's reminding himself When we look to God, when we step out of fear and we step in faith, God takes away that shame. Amen. He continues on. God saves, 34, 6. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. You say, finally. Okay, this is where like I can get out of my situation, right? If I pray and I buy that special anointing rag from the telemarketers, God will take away my credit card debt. He'll save me from my troubles. Just $39.99, guys. You can get a bottle of water that will actually take away MasterCard. I don't think that's what he's saying, guys. I know. It's a shock. I don't think it is. Because why? David is still sitting in a cave being hunted by Saul. I would argue his troubles haven't really gone anywhere. Like he's still wondering, am I going to get killed tomorrow? He's still sitting in the cave going like, one of these guys is going to steal something from me. Like I don't like where I am. So we have to ask ourselves, what are our real troubles? And as I said, I think God is more concerned with your soul than your circumstances. And keep in mind, one original apostle died of natural causes. The other ones died pretty terrible deaths that we wouldn't want. God didn't save them from what we would call troubles. I think our real trouble is not the situation we're in, not the circumstance we're in. I think our real trouble is not understanding what the gospel actually says and trying to save ourselves. You see, God saves us by adopting us into his family and supplying us with the resources that we need to live in relationship with him. Our real trouble is functionally forgetting that and stepping into fear and trying to save ourselves. If I just work hard enough, if I'm a decent person, everything's going to be okay. Stepping in faith says you can't work hard enough and you're not a decent person. You're a sinner who's saved by grace. That our real trouble is not the situation around us. How often though do we say, my real problem is this out here. I'm not the problem. Well, I would say it's you. You're the problem. It's you. He continues on. So God saves. God also protects in 34, seven. This is what it says. The angel of the Lord encamps around me those who fear him and delivers him. God gives protection around us. You say, well, what is God protecting us from? Because I, I don't know all your stories. I know some of my stories and I know some of my people's stories and I have people who've gone through pretty terrible situations. Loved ones die, cancer, car accidents, job losses, really terrible things. You say, well, well is God, God wasn't protecting us then. I think what God is protecting us from is, uh, is from sin and from our enemy. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says this, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This verse is one of the most twisted verses in popular culture, I'd say. This along with like, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Uh, this is up there though. Because you've probably heard someone say, God will never give you more than you can handle. That's garbage. Like, that's trash. God actually intentionally, on purpose, gives you way more than you can handle. He took a bunch of uneducated, like, fishermen and said, I'm going to have you change the world. You think Peter was like, I got this. (laughs) Absolutely not. All of them were like, you want us to do what now? You want us to, okay, like that seems, seems a little out of my 
out of my comfort zone here, God. Like if we were on Zillow, I would not apply for this job. Like it's, I, I don't have the qualifications for it. God intentionally, on purpose, gives you more than you can handle. There's a great story in the Old Testament about Gideon. Gideon uh, built an army and he was going to go attack the enemies of God. And God uh, actually told him, hey, you have too many guys, which is typically not what you say in a military situation. And he actually gave Gideon this really weird, arbitrary test uh, of how guys drank out of a stream. And he said, guys who do a certain way, I want you to send them home. And he whittled it down to 300 men. And you're like, oh, I've heard this story. It's King Leonidas. No, it's not. It's in the Bible. And Gideon had 300 guys and Gideon said, why? why? Why in the world am I going to go to fight with less people? And God said, because you're going to win. And if you had more people, you're going to think you did it. And so I'm actually going to make it happen. So there's no other way that you can take credit for this, but to point to me and say, God did this. Because God gave Gideon more than he can handle. God is giving you more than you can handle, guys. That's not what this passage is saying. Here's what it is saying. That every temptation that comes your way, there is a way of escape. There is a way to fight that temptation. You see, if we think that all sin is functionally forgetting the truths about God, there is a way to handle temptation. We can look to Jesus. When he went into the wilderness, he was tempted by Satan three different times. Do you know how he fought against each three of those temptations? He quoted scripture. That if we say sin is functionally forgetting truths about God, or maybe we could say it's believing lies, the only way to combat that is to proclaim truth to the lies that we're hearing. There's a really great book called You Can Change. It's by a guy named Tim Chester, and he makes the same argument. And he says every sin is functionally a disbelief or forgetting of four essential truths about God. That God is great, so I don't have to be in control that God is glorious, so I don't have to fear others, that God is good, so I don't have to look elsewhere for satisfaction, and that God is gracious, so I don't have to prove myself. You see, God has given you protection from sin and the enemy through his word, which this tells the story of who God is and what he's done and who you get to be because of it. And he's also given you protection through his people, a community that can rally around you, reminding you of these truths when you're forgetting it. That he has given you protection. That as you're inviting people to come praise God with you, that there are his, his word to remember the truths because all temptation and all sin is a lie being presented to you. You, you, can't, you, you can't do it. What are people gonna think about you? You're, you're kind of a screw up. You know, it'd be better if you just turn on Netflix and just kind of check out. You know, she, she doesn't deserve you. He, he doesn't actually treat you well. You could, you could walk away, right? You know what? Your kids aren't listening. You just need to use fear and intimidation. Every sin is a lie that's being offered up about how you gain control of your life, how you are scared of what other people think of you, how you look for satisfaction through food, drink, numbing media, or trying to prove yourself, like I earn it. And, and what, what we're saying is there is protection because there are truths to be proclaimed to the lies that are being presented to you. So David lays out for us that the outcome of living out of faith is fear, and we see that God answers, God removes shame, God saves, and God protects we move into verses 8 to 10, which are the, the last verses we're going to cover. And I think David gives an invitation to live out of faith instead of fear. So he kind of breaks it down for us about this is, what it, this is what I do to turn from fear to faith. This is what God does in those moments. And here's an invitation. Verse 8 says this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. David gives us all an invitation to experience what he is experiencing, moving from fear to faith. And the only way to do that is to experience God relationally, not intellectually, but actually experience God. Let's talk about The Rock for a little bit. Stick with me. And you're like, The Rock? Yeah, Dwayne Johnson. Give it a second. One of the highest paid movie actors of all time. 
And I know what you're saying, like, all oh, those movies are terrible. And yet you go see them. <laughs> Think about that for a second. He's got you trapped. You know, he actually played defensive tackle at the University of Miami. He was on the national championship team for the Hurricanes in 1991. He didn't get a lot of playing time, though. He actually played behind a guy named Warren Sapp, who was, a, who was now a Hall of Famer. Played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Warren Sapp has a Super Bowl ring with them. You know, after that, he actually went and played semi-pro football in Canada. The Calvary Stampeders. He wasn't great. He got cut pretty quick. He was first married in 1997. He had one daughter uh, named Simone. Unfortunately, they divorced in 2008, but it's okay. He found love again in 2019. He married and had two more daughters, Jasmine and Tiana. And I know what you're thinking right now. No one knows The Rock. Unfortunately, I don't. If he walked in right now, you would, number one, ask, why is he in Bend? But he could walk in and i go, oh my gosh, Dwayne, DJ, let's talk about your time playing for the Hurricanes. And he would look at me and say, who are you? I have no concept of who you are. You see, I can quote stats about him. I do not know him. And here's the fear, church. The fear is that you would be able to have stats about God and not actually know him. That you could win any Awana sword drill that they put in front of you. You can quote the Ten Commandments. You have Bible verses on pictures hanging in your house. You have a, you have a cup. People ask you how you're doing, and you go, blessed and highly favored. And yet not actually know him. We live in a society that idolizes celebrities and sports figures, and we can list off stats. Your favorite team, you can list off how many yards they have. You can list win-loss records, maybe actors, singers. You know, every, you know where they're on tour. You know the different songs. You can sing all their songs by heart, and yet you don't know them. You simply know facts. David is inviting us to actually taste and see that the Lord is good. And you can't do that through facts. You can't do that through a stat sheet of what God has done. You can only taste and see through actual relationship between you and God. Yeah. See, David's inviting us to actually experience God ourselves, not our parents' God, not coming to church for the kids, not this is, I guess, what I'm supposed to do, but to actually experience God. Verses 9, he continues on for us. He says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. David's playing with this word fear. You see, it was fear being scared that drove David to this cave. And yet he's calling us to fear, which means worship God. And he says, we lack no good thing. If we go back to that passage in 2 Peter that I read at the beginning, it says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Then P Peter spends some time listing off kind of resources that we have in God. And then in verse 9, this is what he says. For whoever, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted <clears throat> excuse me, that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed of his former sin. You know what nearsighted is? I don't know if you have bad eyes. I have terrible eyes, like really bad. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to the eye doctor. Actually, one of the, my eye doctor now, he's an elder at my church, so it's pretty cool. And I talk to him about my eyes all the time. I'm like, why are they so bad? And he doesn't have great answers. But um, So I wear corrective lenses. I got contacts. I got glasses, all this stuff. So nearsighted, nearsighted is the one where you can see right in front of you, and, but you can't see like beyond it. And so what Peter is saying, it's fantastic what he's saying, because you know what happens is stress of life hits our lives pain, conflict hits our lives. And you know what happens? We can just look at the thing that's right in front of us. And yet the cross is fuzzy in the background. And all we can think about and all we can see is this problem and the stress that is sitting right in front of us. Stress of the world, fights in your marriage, your kids disobeying, struggling at your job, uncertain political climate, scary world events that are happening all over the place. 
struggles at work, finances chipping away. And what happens is that that stuff goes on and Peter says we become nearsighted, that we just focus on this stuff. And yet yet the, the cross, which represents everything, becomes blurry and we can't see it. Peter says in that verse, you've forgotten you were cleansed of your former sins. You go, well, no, if I got saved, like I never forget that I was cleansed of my former sins. What he's talking about is a functional forgetting of what that actually means, of the resources you have available, that you are therefore now a new creation, that you are in relationship with the God of the universe. You, you think he doesn't have scary world events? You don't think God has seen weird political times before? You don't think he understands the struggles that you're having in your marriage? You don't think he knows it's a hardship where two sinners actually live together, that it's not going to butt up against each other? You think all of a sudden this is shocking to him, that it's out of his control? And he says, well, dang, I didn't see that coming. You see, we become nearsighted. We only see what's right in front of us and the, the resource and the cross and living out of faith, it becomes fuzzy in the background. So what do we do? What do we do when we're nearsighted? What do we do when we see this? Well, we go back to Psalm 34, 1 to 3. And you know what we do, church? We commit to building a practice of praise in our lives. We remember what God has done and we boast about it to everyone. And we invite others to join with us in our praise. Because I will tell you, I get nearsighted a lot. I focus on the stress of my job, uh, the stress of both my jobs. I focus on uh, not having enough time. I focus on not getting things done. I focus on what's going on in Seattle with my job as a police officer. I focus on my kids as they're growing and what we're doing. And they just get mouthier, don't they? They seem to just get mouthier. And I focus on that. Say, are we parenting the right way? What do I need to do? Do I need to be softer? Do I need firmer? What's going to happen? Are they going to be ready to launch out of our home? Have we done everything we can? And I get riled up constantly. And I become so nearsighted that these are the only things I focus on. And the only way I get out of that, typically for me, is I need someone else to refocus my vision. I need my wife. I need my elders. I need the, what we call gospel community, people around me to say, hey, whoa, whoa, stop. Like the the cross is really fuzzy to you right now, Noah. Like let's let's stop talking about this because God has this. But let's remember who God is and what he's done and who you get to be because of it. Let's refocus our vision here. You see, because then we can see the things that cause us fear, and yet we can see at the same time the resources that God has given us to deal with those things that cause fear. That we need to refocus and not be nearsighted. So we got to ask the question, like, what what does this matter for us? Psalm 34, verses 1 to 10, what, what does it matter? And I think there are, I mean, two categories of people that I would anticipate being in this room. If you're here today and, and you would say you're not a Christian, right? You, you haven't given your sin to Jesus. You're not walking in a relationship with Jesus. Church is new. Maybe you're here just checking it out and you're not sure what it means to be saved. I will tell you everything in this world is terrifying. It is why depression and anxiety meds are some of the highest pres- prescriptions in our world. Because it, it is scary. Are you struggling to manage the fear around you? Are you struggling to manage your family, your job, the world around you? Have you been living out of fear? Do you look at some aspects of your life and you say, man, I've, I've gone to places I never thought I'd go. I've done things I, I never thought I'd do. And I've said things I, I never thought I would say before. That's where fear takes you. Fear takes you to the cave. I will tell you here today, though, that you can lay those fears down at the cross and you can pick up the confidence that the God of the universe gives you. It is as simple as admitting that you are a savior who's in need of, or a sinner in need of a savior. You see, the cross is this wonderful symbol that we use. It's kind of weird, right? You'll see people, there's, there's jewelry, tattoos, like super weirdos get tattoos of crosses on their body. Um, it's a little hurtful. That wasn't a joke. Um, but, but it's what it means, right? Because otherwise, why, why don't I have a guillotine on the other form? If I'm just like, you know what I want? I want to display weird methods of execution throughout the ages. Nobody has that. You got a cannonball necklace that you wear? That's weird. 
No, why? Because it's what it represents. You see, the cross is a symbol that echoes through all of history. I can't do it on my own. I cannot save myself. I am a sinner in need of a savior. And yet Jesus is that savior for me. If you're here today and you have not given your sin to Jesus, I beg you, I urge you, I implore you, you can lay your fears down at the foot of the cross and know that the God of the universe wants to walk in relationship with you and he will take your fear, he will take your shame and he will give you his grace, his confidence and his righteousness instead. If you're here today and you're like, well, I've been walking with Jesus for a long time. I've given my sin to Jesus. I would say that I'm saved. What I would say to you is what do you do when fear creeps in? Because just becoming a Christian does not magically solve everything, right? It doesn't. How are you fighting against being nearsighted in your life? Because it's not a are you or aren't you. It's when are you and when aren't you. How have you built a practice of praise into your life? How do you remember what God has done and how are you bragging about it to everyone? And who have you invited in to praise with you? And I would say for everyone here, our world and our culture is dominated by fear. It's everywhere. And depending on how far down the rabbit trail you want to go, I think there's a lot of, a lot of forces that like to conjure up fear to keep people scared. There's fear of failure, fear of what people think. There's fear of the unknown. David is an example of how living out of fear takes you to those places you never thought you'd go, has you doing things you never thought you would do, and has you saying things you never thought you would say. And yet Psalm 34 is a guidebook of how do we turn, when we find that we've been living in fear, how do we turn from fear to faith? David is a story of constant sin and repentance, sin and repentance. And here, as he's looking around, evaluating where he is, and he's saying, man, I am not living out of faith right now. Fear has dominated every decision that I've made. And he says, I need to turn my praise back. I think that's the invitation for us today, everyone here. Instead of being dominated by fear, how do we live out of faith Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you so much for this story. I thank you for this book. And God, I thank you for David's life, that we can look to him and how you moved and worked in his life. And God, I do pray that as we become nearsighted people, as we're forgetting who you are and what you've done, who we get to be because of it, God, you would come and you would help refocus our vision, that we would remember that we are adopted into your family and given resources and all we need for life and godliness. God, I pray that this would be a community of people that would regularly point each other back to your truths and back to you. And we thank you that you are a savior that removes shame, that removes guilt, and gives righteousness and grace freely. In your name, amen.